Hello, everyone. Um, your regular host of the Art and Proud African LGBTI YouTube channel. Uh, it's an unusual one today. Uh, we are at the Art and Proud Studios. This afternoon, I have a very, very, very important guest. He is uh, a LGBT and human rights defender. He's a journalist. He's a writer. A documentary film was released about him. He's not only involved in the LGBT um, activism. He is. Um, he had somebody describe him as his policy is human policy. I have this afternoon Peter Tatchell of the Peter Tatchell Foundation. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. I'm so glad to join you and your viewers. Thank you very much. For the purpose of my viewers, can you tell us who Peter Tatchell is? Well, I am a human rights defender. I'm the director of the Peter Tatchell Foundation, which is a small human rights agency based in London. I have been campaigning for human rights in general and LGBT plus rights in particular for 54 years since the age of 15 when I was still at high school. And here I am today, now age 69, and I'm still going strong. Wow. Well, that is really interesting. What prompted you? to start these uh, human rights activism? Well, my first sort of awareness about social issues was in 1963 when I was 11 years old. I heard about the bombing of a black church in Birmingham, Alabama, in the United States, where four young girls about my own age were murdered by white racists. I was only 11 years old, but I was so shocked by that news. It prompted me to take an interest in and become a follower and admirer of the black civil rights movement in America, led by Dr. Martin Luther King. So that was my first awareness and my first, I suppose, political awakening. But I didn't do anything active in terms of protesting until I was 15 in my hometown of Melbourne, Australia, when a man was due to be hanged, hanged by the neck for a crime where there was serious conflicting evidence. So I was not convinced by his guilt. So I joined the campaign to demand that he not be hanged. However, we had a very right-wing state government and the Premier authorized that man to be hanged, despite there being a reasonable doubt about his guilt. Now that really prompted my lifetime skepticism of authority. I thought to myself, if the government can hang a man where there is at least some doubt about whether he was guilty of the crime of murder, then I can't trust that government. I can't trust the police. I can't trust the courts. So it made me a lifelong skeptic of authority. It led me to question other things that I'd never previously thought about, such as the appalling mistreatment of indigenous black Australians, the Aboriginal people whose land was settled and taken over by English settlers in the 18th century. It led me to question Australia's involvement with the United States in the war in Vietnam and to oppose that war and oppose the draft for that war. Then when I was 17 in 1969, I realized I was gay. And soon afterwards, I heard about the first gay liberation protests in New York. I thought to myself, wow, I want to be part of this. And so I began basically a one man LGBT plus campaign in my hometown of Melbourne, Australia, because at that time there were no LGBT plus organizations in Melbourne. There were no counseling services, no switchboards, no helplines, 
absolutely nothing. So I began a one-man campaign because I couldn't get any other gay person to get involved because they were too afraid. They were afraid of being rejected by their family, sacked by their employer, or even arrested by the police. It wasn't until I came to London in 1971, age 19, that I was able to get involved in a gay rights movement. That was the Gay Liberation Front, which had not long previously been established. It was such a personal liberation to be able to work with other LGBT plus people for our common liberation. I want to ask, in the course of this, all these activities, you have encountered dictators. I mean, on one-on-one, -on -one, an instance was uh, your encounter with late Robert Mugabe in Brussels, where you were attacked by his thugs that are called his bodyguards. What was going through your mind in that instance and several others like that when you put yourself in, in harm's way? Well, well, all my international activism is based upon the principle of solidarity, that we all have a duty to help each other. When a person is being victimized or a community is being victimized, it's important we all rally to them and support them. So the activism I've done internationally has always been to support the campaigners in those countries and in response to their requests for help. So Zimbabwean human rights defenders asked me to do something to highlight the abuses of the Mugabe regime. And that prompted me to act on a tip-off that President Mugabe was going to Brussels in 2001 and my plan was to lay in wait um, outside the hotel where he was visiting and try to get him put under arrest on charges of torture under Belgian and international human rights law. But I can tell you, I was very afraid because you try and arrest a head of state, you can get charged with very serious offenses and end up in prison. Also, I knew, given the brutality of his regime, that uh, his minders may well violently assault me. But I was determined, I felt a duty to do something to support the brave, heroic defenders inside uh, Zimbabwe, who had themselves often been arrested, detained without trial, tortured, and some of them actually murdered by Mugabe's thugs. I felt a duty to do something to support them. So that sense of duty overrode my own fears and anxieties. And as many of you will have seen on the footage that's available on YouTube, um, I was very badly beaten up by Mugabe's thugs. Uh, in the end, I was beaten unconscious and it has left me with some brain and eye damage and long-term post-traumatic stress disorder. But I do not regret it one iota. Obviously, I did not want to get beaten up and suffer that damage. But, ironically, the fact that this happened to me was a PR coup for me and the people in Zimbabwe. Uh, everybody around the world, when they saw that footage, thought to themselves, if President Mugabe is prepared to beat unconscious a peaceful protester in the heart of a European capital city in broad daylight in front of the world's media, just imagine what he's doing to his own people when no one is watching. So that action really helped highlight the brutality of the Mugabe regime and prompted many, many media around the world to start investigating the tyranny of his regime. Thank you very much, Peter. Glad that you survived that, and uh, we're glad that you're still alive, kicking, and doing what you love doing best. I'm going to move a bit into um, a topic that is dear to your heart. It's the um, African LGBT community. Um, most of us escaped persecution 
from home. And when you get to uh, a safe country, especially like the United Kingdom, the process of uh, granting uh, refugee to LGBT uh, members has been very cumbersome in some state, in, in, in some instances. Um, how would you describe your interaction with the African LGBT community in relation to uh, the Home Office procedures? Well, first let me say that I'm very proud that I personally and my Peter Tatchell Foundation have helped secure asylum status for hundreds of LGBT plus refugees over the last 30 to 40 years, hundreds. Um, we, of course, have not done it alone, but, for example, we often write letters to support the asylum applications of LGBT refugees from African countries, and these letters can then be cited in court as evidence to support their claim for asylum. Um, our starting point is obviously that Britain has an obligation under the 1951 Refugee Convention to give a safe haven to people are fleeing persecution. And one of the major reasons for people fleeing persecution in Africa and around the world is because of people's sexual orientation or their gender identity. So we do what we can to help. But as you know, it's an uphill battle because the asylum system in Britain is rigged against refugees. I mean, just think about it. Lots of the refugees we've helped have been put in detention. And asylum detention centers are basically prisons by another name. You know, the person does not have freedom. They're, they're, they're behind a locked, closed, secure facility. It makes it very difficult for them to prepare their asylum case, to gather the necessary documentation and evidence they need to prove that they're at risk of persecution, and indeed to prove their sexuality. So we are part of a campaign that argues that no refugee should be put in an asylum detention center unless there is strong evidence that they have committed a sexual or violent offense. Otherwise, they should not be detained. Uh, we are also part of a campaign to try and improve the conditions for refugees who are not put into asylum, into asylum but who are forced to live in home office provided hostels. Many of these hostels are substandard. They would not be acceptable for any member of the British public. You know, I've dealt with refugees living in hostels with no functioning toilet or shower or with shower facilities covered with mold and fungus, um, with electric lights that don't work, um, with cookers and stoves that are actually dangerous. Um, so we are saying that the standards of accommodation must be radically improved. Of course, there are some decent hostels. There are some, but not a lot. Um, the other campaign we're also supporting is to demand a lift to the ban on uh, asylum seekers working. Under the current law, when you're seeking asylum, you're prohibited by law from working. Now that is ridiculous. First of all, it means that an asylum seeker is forced to live on less than 40 pounds a week for their food, clothing, transport, mobile phone, toiletries, etc. That is impossible. So, so many refugees are living in a state of destitution. That is just unconscionable. These people have suffered persecution. They should not suffer further persecution and poverty here in Britain. So we're saying lift the ban because of course it, it's madness for the British taxpayer to pay benefits of, of less than 40 pounds a week to a refugee when that refugee could be working. And we know that many refugees have skills that Britain needs. You know, I, I've just been helping a, a, a guy who fled from Uganda via Poland and he is now in a social care home looking after elderly and disabled people. 
you know, he's, he, the, his wage isn't good, but he is providing them love and care and support that is to their great benefit. I know of another refugee who's a doctor. Uh, he's working in medical practice to help his patients. Others are architects, carpenters, plumbers, teachers, a whole range of different occupations. Some are just laborers, but you know, we need laborers in Britain to pick fruit, to pick fruit on our farms, to build the new houses that people need. So the whole system is rotten. And I feel so ashamed that our government and these successive governments have failed to fix this system, to make it fair and equitable. So for all of you who are going through the asylum process, I am on your side. I know what you're going through. I support you. I know it's very, very difficult. Just keep the faith. Just hold on to that hope that in the end, you will win refugee status and your worries will be over. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, before going to my next questions, I, I'm going to wrap two questions into one. My first contact with the Peter Tashel foundation was when I was at, when I was detained at Hammersworth. And uh, thanks to you for the enlightenment, just like the good work that you're doing. Now, um, sometimes in 2016, two LGBT activists were hacked to death in Bangladesh. You led and part, was part of the uh, protest against the uh, horrendous act in Bangladesh that year. That same year, um, in Cameroon, the, um, the government strengthened the laws against uh, homosexuality. What we've seen this year, for instance, in Cameroon, um, two trans women were jailed, um, three LGBT Cameroonians have been killed. They were killed in February. Uh, about 27 arrests have been made and several other African countries. In Uganda, uh, 44 arrests were made. In Ghana, uh, we have situation of uh, 24 LGBT activists arrested, they've been granted bail. Um, what is the way forward for the LGBT community around the world? And um, what advice do you have for LGBT activists of African origin? Well, I guess my first thing to say is shame on the Commonwealth. <laughs> All the countries you mention are members of the Commonwealth, yes. which has a charter which pledges to respect personal and individual freedom, equality, and non-discrimination. All Commonwealth countries have signed that charter, yet most of them, 35 out of 53, still criminalize same-sex relations and eight Commonwealth countries still have life imprisonment for homosexuality. Uh, in parts of two countries, Pakistan and Nigeria, gay people can face the death penalty. Now the question is, why isn't the Commonwealth speaking out? Why are these countries allowed to remain members of the Commonwealth when they are violating the principles of the Commonwealth Charter? You know, the Commonwealth is just so, so shameful in the way it looks away and ignores the plight of LGBT plus people. So that's the first point. You know, I would say that the Commonwealth should at the very least suspend countries that violate LGBT plus human rights. They should not be allowed to carry on as normal as usual. Um, the second thing I would say is that each country, the activists there must chart their own course and do what they think is best and right. But I would say that we have uh, some very successful examples of ways in which LGBT plus activists have used the courts to overturn criminalization and other discriminations. So you will know that in Botswana, Trinidad and Tobago and India, legal actions led to striking down the anti-LGBT laws in those countries. So if politicians are too cowardly to act, why not use the courts? 
and nearly all the countries that are involved have constitutions that guarantee equal treatment and non-discrimination. They don't say equal treatment and non-discrimination for heterosexuals only. They say equal treatment and non-discrimination for all citizens. So that could be the legal basis on which activists in those countries, like Uganda, Cameroon, Ghana, Nigeria, and so on, could use the law to overturn the criminalization of same-sex relations. In addition, of course, those countries have signed up to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which also guarantee equal treatment and non-discrimination to everyone. So these countries can be held to account over the human rights treaties they have signed and pledged to uphold. Furthermore, uh, when it comes to Africa, the African Union, which represents all the countries of Africa, it has a human rights commission. And several years ago, that commission called out homophobic, biphobic, and transphobic discrimination and hate crime. It also has an African charter on human and people's rights. And there are two clauses in that charter which say that member states, all the member states in Africa, must ensure equal treatment and non-discrimination for their citizens. So there's another instance where governments can be held to account and where legal challenges can be made to overturn the ban on same-sex relations. Thank you very much, Peter. I want to ask, what's your opinion? I know there is a campaign right now um, with respect to conversion therapy. I know you are one of the campaigners against it. Uh, in the African community, it is rampant, both here in the UK and back home in Africa. What is your opinion about it? Well, as we all know, every reputable medical, psychiatric, and counseling organization in the world has condemned conversion therapy as unethical, ineffective, and harmful. So there's no way that this practice, or rather I should say this abuse, should be allowed to continue. Uh, I've heard of so many instances where people claim to have been cured by conversion therapy only to discover a few years later that they were caught out in a gay bar or a gay sauna. Clearly, the practice does not work. There was an organization here in Britain called the Courage Trust in the 1980s and 1990s, which claimed to be able to cure um, LGBT plus people. It was a Christian organization. They had very, very strict rules and procedures. You had to sign up. You had to go and live in a safe house in a remote part of the country. Um, you weren't allowed to be in another room with another person of the same sex at the same time unless there was a chaperone to supervise you. Um, for those who were allowed to go and visit family members, if their family members lived outside of London and they had to go through London to visit their families, that was prohibited. They had to use alternative routes to avoid London because the Courage Trust said London was a sin, sinful place, a den of homosexuality. Really? Now, the Courage Trust did this work for 20 years, but to their great courage and respect, eventually they realized not only was what they were doing not working, it was actually harmful. So the founder of the Courage Trust, Jeremy Marks, now runs an organization which seeks to help LGBT plus Christians come to terms with their homosexuality. He doesn't try to change them. In fact, he says changing is impossible and immoral. What he does is helps people 
come to accept who they are. So I think that's a great example of why the British government, after promising for three years to ban conversion therapy, should do so right now. There is no excuse for any further delay. I want to go to a campaign. It's, it's a quiet one. It's about uh, Ida Hobbit. I saw somewhere where you inserted capital L. That is International Day Against Homophobia, uh, Transphobia, and, you know, you, you, you inserted L. What's that all about? Well, well, rather than just having Ida Hobbit, we want to have the International Day Against Homophobia, Biphobia, Lesphobia, Intersex Phobia, and transphobia to make it fully inclusive oh. so that that was our, our goal to recognize intersex people and lesbians who had not previously been recognized in that acronym oh. um and i think you know that went down very very well i didn't have a single complaint everybody said yes that's a good thing we want to make this day inclusive for all members of our community that's good uh, briefly, uh, can you tell me, what, there was this story about you being involved because among African countries, in South Africa, it's, oh, South Africa uh, is open to uh, LGBT, but culturally, we still know these issues. You were involved with Tambo Mbeki before the ANC took power in South Africa mm -hmm. towards accepting the LGBT plus people. How did that, I mean, just tell us briefly, what's that all about? Well, I was involved in the anti-apartheid movement, both in my homeland of Australia and also here in the UK. I was an activist, uh, but I was horrified that some members of the African National Congress, the ANC, were very homophobic. And so I thought to myself, well, look, if we don't challenge the ANC now, when they come to power, they'll end up like Cuba. And as some of you may know, um, in Cuba, LGBT plus people were very badly persecuted in the 1970s and 1980s. So what I did was I wrote a letter to Thabo Mbeki in 1987 when he was the ANC's information minister based in exile in Lusaka. And I appealed to him for the ANC to ditch its homophobia and to embrace LGBT plus rights. I said to him, LGBT plus rights is consistent with the ANC's Freedom Charter. The Freedom Charter was a set of principles the ANC um, based its struggle on. And those principles included respect, dignity and equality for all South African citizens. So I said, obviously, you can include LGBT plus people within that. You know, it doesn't look good for you as a liberation organization to be colluding with the persecution of South Africans who happen to be LGBT plus. Um, there was a big debate within the ANC, um, but within three months, Tabo Mbeki wrote back to me, in fact, he sent a telegram, <laughs> they, they don't exist anymore, but he sent a telegram um, confirming that the ANC had discussed the issue, the ANC executive in exile had discussed the issue, and they had agreed that LGBT plus people had a place in a free and independent South Africa, and that the ANC was committed to LGBT plus rights. So then what I did was, I took the copy of this telegram and then sent it to LGBT plus activists inside South Africa, to anti-apartheid movements around the world, to the ANC underground inside South Africa, and urged them to you know begin a debate. And indeed this is what happened. The LGBT LGBT plus activists inside South Africa generated this debate primarily within the United Democratic Front, which was the main umbrella anti-apartheid group inside South Africa, um, and one majority support there. So that was a big, big, big coup because, you know, 
to get the ANC to be committed to LGBT rights before apartheid fell and before they came to power, that was almost certainly going to guarantee that they would do good things when they eventually became the government. But I wasn't prepared to let it, let it go there. Um, I'd heard that one of the senior ANC members, L.B. Sachs, was in London drafting a provisional post-apartheid constitution. So this was the constitution that the ANC would adopt if it became the government in South Africa. So I approached him and said, will you please consider including non-discrimination based on sexual orientation in the new post-apartheid constitution? To be honest, he was a bit skeptical to begin with. Um, but then I presented to him examples of potential wording and also examples of anti-discrimination laws, not constitutions, but laws that existed in countries like the Netherlands, Denmark, and Sweden. So once he had this, he realized it was doable, it was achievable. But I was conscious that I was not South African, that I was white. So what I arranged for was two uh, South African LGBT activists, one black, one white, to come fly to London to meet L.B. Sachs and to themselves personally explain why this is important and how it could be achieved. And after that meeting, L.B. Sachs, to his great credit, became convinced that LGBT plus equality should be in the post apartheid constitution, and indeed it was. But as you say, although there is formal legal equality in South Africa, and that's a huge gain, you know, South Africa had even had same-sex marriage before the UK, but there's still a lot of cultural homophobia. So you may have heard the example of two lesbians recently murdered in a township. Um, there's a lot of homophobia, biphobia, and transphobia in South Africa today. So changing the law is good, but it's clearly not enough. Um, I have two questions from uh, members of uh, the Art and Proud African LGBT. I'll just give the two to you so that you can uh, uh, answer them together. Jane, she's from uh, Kenya. She asks, why is the Home Office allowing the application of gay men from Kenya, but turns down the, uh, that of the lesbians saying uh, Kenya is safe for lesbian and they reject their cases. The second one is the new um, immigration rule by Pretty Patel, which intends to, to deport immigrants that comes to the UK. Well, on the first question, the Home Office has an agenda and it is basically to block as many asylum applications as possible. The Home Office listens to the right wing of the Conservative Party, tabloid newspapers like the Daily Mail, and organizations like UKIP. Um, that's where it gets its cue from. Its agenda is all about limiting and restricting the number of refugees who are granted settled status here in the UK. So it tries to use all kinds of ruses. And one of the ruses it uses is that in many countries, lesbianism is not a criminal offense. And that is true. But in quite a lot of countries it is, but in some countries it's not. But that doesn't mean to say that lesbians don't suffer persecution and don't suffer the risk of mob violence, even murder or rape. Um, it doesn't mean they don't suffer loss of a job if they're discovered or maybe eviction from their home. Um, lesbians suffer as well. And just because lesbianism may not be against the law doesn't mean that their cases are invalid. So we really do have to challenge the Home Office, which is obsessed with the legal rules. You know, they say, look, lesbianism is not against the law in this country, therefore we don't think you need uh, a refugee status here in the UK. That is nonsense. Every case must be evaluated on its individual circumstances. And in Kenya, I know that lesbians are at risk of mob violence, of corrective rape, of losing their jobs or homes, of even potential killing by their own family who are ashamed of them. So they have an absolutely strong case 
to secure asylum here in the UK. Refugees who come to the UK via third countries will face deportation. And that is, again, you know, a very draconian interpretation of the law, or maybe extension of the law. It's not really an interpretation, it's an extension of the law. Um, because many refugees need to go via third countries because it's the only way they can get here. And many refugees, of course, have um, family or friends here, so it's understandable why they would want to come to Britain. Um, many of them have the connection of coming from Commonwealth countries, and you know, Britain once colonised these countries, imposed its colonial-era anti-gay laws upon them. We have an absolute duty to make a safe haven for those fleeing persecution in those countries. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's absolutely wrong to think that people are willy-nilly coming here from third countries because there's nowhere else for them to go. Um, for a starter, why would an English-speaking person from Kenya want to go to Germany or France where they can't speak the language? That would greatly restrict their ability to integrate to get a job to support themselves. So we do have to resist and fight back against Priti Patel's attempts to tighten the immigration law and the way they're interpreted. That is so, so wrong. It's just another way of evading Britain's moral and ethical responsibilities to protect those who are fleeing persecution. It doesn't matter how they get got here. The important thing is they need protection. I just, uh, for the uh, benefit of mothers whose children are LGBT, I know uh, there was a program where you and uh, your mom, uh, she's going to be 94, Maddie, uh, you were in the studio together. What did she, at any point, share her experience with you, what she went through? Uh, with knowing that she has a gay son? What I did was a bit unusual. My mother is a very devout evangelical Christian. According to her pretty fundamentalist views, homosexuality is a sin because it says so in the Old Testament. I have challenged her and said, you are a follower of Jesus Christ, but Jesus Christ never said anything against homosexuality. So why are you taking this view? But she says, oh, well, I have to follow the Old Testament too. Um, to which I said, well, look, you know, um, do you really think that if two people love each other and have a consenting sexual relationship, do you really think that's a major sin? And eventually over time she began to say, well, no, not really. It's not, it's not like rape or murder or thieving or anything like that. Um, but she still thinks it's a sin, albeit a minor one. I also said to my mother, look, you know, you are entitled to your belief, but having your belief is one thing. Supporting the government to impose anti-gay laws is something completely different. That's not a Christian teaching. You know, discrimination is not compatible with Christ's gospel of love and compassion. And she sort of has come around to that view. Um, you know, so she would say that although she does believe that homosexuality is wrong, it's not a major sin, and moreover, the law should not discriminate. You know, we are not living in a theocracy. We are a democracy. You know, religion should not and does not dictate the laws of the land. So my mother's actually quite supportive of my human rights work, including my gay rights work. She sees me as challenging discrimination, as helping protect a vulnerable, marginalized community. So in most respect, she's on my side. Sometimes she doesn't always agree with my tactics, but she knows that I'm trying to do the best to protect our communities. And she supports me in that. Um, the other thing that she has always taught me, and which of course has led me to my activism, is she always said to me, don't follow the crowd. 
stick to what you believe in, stand up for what is right, not what is popular. And so I took that to heart and that has inspired much of my human rights activism. We are rounding up right now. Any word for the members of the Art and Proud African LGBT, Peter? I've got a few little appeals, quick appeals for you. First of all, if you don't already, already receive my Peter Tatchell Foundation weekly bulletin, it's a weekly bulletin that comes out every Thursday. It involves a few top human rights and LGBT news stories. Most of them very serious, but some of them very funny. Like this week's one is quite funny. Um, um, I won't say what it's about, but you, you can perhaps find out. Um, it's, it's entirely free. You just go to the Peter Tatchell Foundation website, which is petertatchellfoundation.org. In the top right-hand corner, you'll see a button which says, Join Us. If you give us your email address and then confirm it by email, um, we will then send you this weekly PTF bulletin. Um, it doesn't cost anything. There's no charge. It's entirely free. So please sign up and become part of our human rights community. The second thing I want to say is that if any of you are free next Wednesday, the 23rd of June, at 6 p.m., we'll be outside the Cabinet Office and the Government Equalities Office in Whitehall, which is very near Downing Street. So the nearest tube is Westminster or Charing Cross, will be there to hand in a petition calling on the government to honour its pledge to ban conversion therapy. Um, and we've got lots of different people and organisations attending. I think Baroness Liz Barker from the House of Lords is going to be there. Jane Ozan from the ban conversion therapy campaign will be there and many, many others. So if you're free and able, no obligation, please join us so we can help put pressure on the government. At the same time, we are going to be handing in a petition to ban conversion therapy, the Stop Dithering Petition. Petition says to the government, stop dithering about banning conversion therapy, get on with it. Um, over 7,500 people have signed it. We're going to hand that in at the same time. So please join us. The second thing, which is, gives you a bit more time to plan, is, as you know, Pride in London has been postponed until September. But myself and others, we are organising a replacement Pride Parade in London on Saturday, the 24th of July. This is going to be a grassroots community Pride. No corporates, no commercialisation, no wristbands, no fees to pay. It's entirely 100% free and anybody can attend. You just turn up on the day. We are meeting at 1 p.m. on the 24th of July in Parliament Square, opposite the Houses of Parliament in London, SW1. And then we are going to march up Whitehall, past Downing Street. We're going to shout out to Boris Johnson, stop stalling on LGBT plus rights, including ban conversion therapy, reform the Gender Recognition Act, and give a safe haven to LGBT plus refugees. Then we're going to move further up Whitehall and stop outside Uganda House and have a huge shout out of solidarity with Ugandan LGBT plus people and against the Museveni government and the persecution that's happening there. From there, we're going to march from Trafalgar Square, up Coxpur Street at the side of Trafalgar Square, then up Lower Regent Street to Piccadilly Circus, then up Regent Street to Oxford Circus, then we're going to turn left and go along Oxford Street, and we're going to end up in Hyde Park for a gigantic free-for-all queer picnic. We're asking everyone to bring their own food, drink and music to have a huge, gigantic, open-air party in the park. There'll be no stage, no speakers, just you, me, and all of us. It's going to be absolutely fabulous. And it replicates what happened on the very first Pride Parade in Britain in 1972, 
we started at Trafalgar Square and we went to Hyde Park for a picnic. So we're going to do the same thing this year in honour of those pioneers and the beginnings of Pride, but also to have this very strong political demand for our rights and freedoms. I'm very sad to say that Pride in London has been depoliticised. You know, it doesn't it doesn't push the LGBT plus agenda. It's just now a party and a celebration. So it's so important that you are there. And I ask you to bring your banner, uh, to make your own placards, and probably I expect you'll want to focus particularly on the rights of LGBT plus refugees against Priti Patel and her plans to restrict asylum in this country, uh, against the detention in asylum detention centres, against the way in which LGBT plus people are forced to live in destitution on less than £40 a week. So please come along and spread the word. Uh, for those joining us, just joining us, we've had this afternoon, Peter Thatcher is a legend, is a hero to some of us. And um, if you have not watched that documentary, it's called Hating Peter Thatcher. It's on Netflix. You will love it. It's a collector's item. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you for honoring our invites today. Well, it's been my great honor. I want to pay tribute to all of you for the work you do, um, not only fighting for your own rights to secure asylum, but supporting other refugees. You are showing by your own example what solidarity is all about, helping each other, because together we are stronger. And although many of you have been waiting for a long, long time, Never lose hope. You know, you will win in the end. Out of the hundreds of people that the Peter Tatchell Foundation has helped secure asylum for, we've only ever lost two cases out of about five or 600. So, you know, you're in with a very good chance of securing your status. So support the group, keep the faith, carry on. I'll finish with my motto, which I hope will inspire you. It is very, very simple. Don't accept the world as it is. Dream of what the world could be and then help make it happen. Thank you so much. Thank you much, Peter. It's been a pleasure. It's been an honor. This is still Art and Proud African LGBT YouTube channel. Please watch, share, comment, subscribe if you have not done that yet and turn on the notification button to get more interesting videos like this. Thank you for joining us today. Have a pleasant day. Bye-bye.